Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth. I'm your host, Henry Smith, where we explore the reliability and authenticity of the Bible. Today, a friendly face is back on the show, Brian Wendell. Uh, he's here, uh, he's with the ABR staff and with us today to talk about the book of Daniel, one of the most interesting, fascinating, and important books found in the Old Testament. Oh, Brian, welcome back to Digging for Truth, my friend. Hey, thanks so much, Henry. Great to join you again. Love doing these top 10 lists with yeah, you. That's right. We're doing the Daniel Top 10 Countdown. And uh, I'm really excited to do this one with you. Um, I guess we could say about just about any topic in the Bible, there's controversy surrounding X, Y, or Z, what we might say about the Bible. But uh, Daniel has its own particular controversies. Uh, maybe you could uh, give an intro to that, and we can jump into our top 10 list. Sure. Well, uh, you're right. Daniel is one of the most hotly contested books of the Bible, and um, it purports to describe events in the 6th century BC of, of Israel and the exiles in Babylon, and it's traditionally been a, a, attributed to Daniel, the prophet. Uh, but since the 19th century, scholars have doubted its historicity. They've doubted Daniel wrote it. They say, no, 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 it was probably written by someone in the 2nd century BC, um, and that it, it was written to encourage the Jewish people who were being persecuted under Antiochus Epiphanes and in, in, in about the 160s. But, but recent linguistical studies studying the, the language of the book of Daniel have pointed out that the Hebrew that's used in the book of Daniel, for example, is, uh, is, is earlier Hebrew. It predates the Hebrew that we find in the second century BC Dead Sea Scrolls, for example. And another study has looked at the Aramaic that's used in the book of Daniel and discovered that it is Imperial Aramaic and that it is Imperial Aramaic from the period of about 600 to 330 BC, not the Imperial Aramaic of a, of a later time, particularly during the second century BC. Moreover, I think that there are, is good reason based on the archaeological evidence as well to believe that the Bible is, that this book was written by Daniel and that it does accurately describe the events of the sixth century BC. Uh, that's a good, that's a good intro, Brian, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, no matter, there's different interpretations of uh, Daniel's visions of the future about future kingdoms. And we're not going to get into that. Our intention is not to get into that today. But the point of that is that it does point to future kingdoms that are later than the sixth century, and therefore it has this prophetic dimension. And the implications are, of course, about the ability to see the future and only God could reveal it to him. So that was, those broad principles are in play apologetically. And so the evidence points to what you're saying, a sixth century origin and not a later origin. So let's start jumping into the archaeology, Brian. You already covered the linguistic stuff just briefly. Uh, let's begin with number 10. All right, number 10 is the Nebuchadnezzar Stella. The book of Daniel begins with these words, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar was uh, the king who reigned over Babylon for over 40 years in the sixth century BC. He was known as a conqueror. The Bible describes him as the destroyer of nations in Jeremiah 4, verse 7. And he greatly expanded the Neo-Babylonian empire. And he attacked Jerusalem on at least three occasions in 605 BC, when uh, Daniel was taken as captive to Babylon, again in 597 BC, when the prophet Ezekiel was deported, and finally, when it was destroyed in 587, 586, depending on which, um, which uh, year you land on, when the city was finally destroyed. There are only four images known of King Nebuchadnezzar. Most of them are in a poor state um, on the side of a cliff, but this one image from the Nebuchadnezzar Stella gives us a good idea of the Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel knew. It shows a picture of him uh, standing. He's bearded. He's dressed in his royal robe. He's wearing a conical crown. He's holding a long staff. He's standing before a ziggurat. Some people have mistakenly called this the Tower of Babel, Stella. It has nothing to do with the Tower of Babel. That is the um, the inscription goes on to say that that's the him standing in front of a tower that's dedicated to the Babylonian god Marduk. And so this was the number 10 uh, discovery related to Daniel. 
Uh, I'll just keep going. Number nine. Number nine is the uh, Nebo Sarsakim tablet. This is a really interesting one. Uh, when Daniel and his friends were taken um, to the royal courts in Babylon, they were given re-education. They were placed in the care of Ashpenaz, the chief official. And the root word, Hebrew word there, is the word Saris, which often refers to a eunuch. So Ashpenaz was the chief eunuch. And in 2007, uh, an Assyriologist who was translating a uh, cuneiform tablet from the British Museum found that it contained a, a reference to the Babylonian Rab Saris, chief eunuch uh, named Nebo Sarsakim, who had paid a large sum of money to a temple in Babylon. And it's important because references to chief eunuchs are very rare in ancient inscriptions, and here we have one. Uh, it's also important for a number of other reasons. First of all, Jeremiah 39.3, we see this same man, Nebo Sarsakim, who is, a, who is the chief um, eunuch who was serving Nebuchadnezzar during the fall of Babylon in 587. Uh, BC, and um, it caused the uh, the director of the Department of the Middle East of the British Museum to exclaim, "This is a fantastic discovery, a world class find. If Nebo Sarsakim existed, which other lesser figures in the Old Testament existed? A throwaway detail in the Old Testament turns out to be accurate and true. Of course, those of us who have a high regard for Scripture, that's not surprising in the least. But the Nebo Sarsakim tablet is important because not only does it mention the person." Who, um, who Jeremiah uh, mentions, it affirms this title, chief, um, chief eunuch, which is used in Daniel 1.3. And so, um, so Daniel actually likely knew at least two chief eunuchs in Babylon, Ashpenaz, who oversaw his, his training, and, and Nebo Sarsakim, who held the role a decade or two later. Uh, it's excellent. Again, the throw, a throwaway detail that puts Dan, uh, Daniel and J Jeremiah in particular in a historical context. How could they possibly know of this person uh, centuries later? Okay, so uh, I'd like to explore that further, but we can't. We've got to move to number eight. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you about 45 seconds to introduce it, and we'll, f we'll finish on the other side. Number eight, please. All right, number eight is uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's palace. Uh, in Daniel 4.4, 4, King Nebuchadnezzar says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. He was a great builder, um, and one of his grand achievements was, of course, his palace. Uh, palace Daniel was no doubt familiar with, uh, being in the courts of the king of Babylon. And uh, in one of his inscriptions, Nebuchadnezzar describes how he rebuilt his father's palace in greater grandeur, using mighty cedars for the roof, doors of cedar, overlaid with copper, thresholds, sockets of bronze, precious stones throughout. And so um, we'll talk after the break about the discovery of Nebuchadnezzar's palace. Excellent. Uh, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth, friends. We're talking about the top 10 discoveries related to Daniel with my friend and colleague, Brian Wendell. We'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. We're doing the top 10 uh, countdown of discoveries related to the book of Daniel. All right, Brian, let's pick back up with the uh, Nebuchadnezzar's palace. Nebuchadnezzar's palace was the number eight find. It was actually excavated beginning in 1899 by Robert Caldaway. He led excavations there at Babylon for 18 years, and he uncovered uh, significant parts of the city, including Nebuchadnezzar's palace. Um, the main southern palace was trapezoidal in shape and constructed around large courtyards. Now, here's the sad part. Uh, the sad part is that in 1987, Saddam Hussein ordered the palace to be rebuilt with little regard for archaeological past that he was erasing, and it's been dubbed Disney for a despot. And so what you can actually see from Google Earth, which matches the uh, drawing that Robert Caldaway did when he excavated it, the site you can see from Google Earth is actually Nebuchadnezzar's reconstructed 
uh, palace that, that Saddam Hussein reconstructed uh, there. So that was number eight. All right, now number seven, the Temple of Marduk, Brian. All right, Temple of Marduk. There were two primary structures that dominated the landscape of ancient Babylon. One was the main temple to the Babylonian god Marduk, and the other was the great ziggurat, which stood uh, several seven la layers high and contained a shrine to Marduk at the top. Um, and they were located next to each other, just past Nebuchadnezzar's palace along the Grand Processional. And... Uh, Daniel records that Nebuchadnezzar, when he um, took vessels from the Temple of Jerusalem, placed them in the treasury of his god. Now, of the two structures, I believe that it was likely in the Temple of Marduk that he actually placed these uh, captured vessels from the temple. It was a massive complex, lots of rooms, two massive courtyards. It had a holy of holies where this um, statue of Marduk resided. And um, I think it's more reasonable to assume that it was placed in there than it was taking it up to the top, all the stuff up to the top of the ziggurat where there was a relatively small shrine there. And if this is the case, uh, both of them, that basically what remains are just the foundations of both of these today. Uh, but if this is the case, you wonder how many times did Daniel walk that processional way, walk past the temple of Marduk and look longingly, knowing that the vessels from the temple were inside that structure? Yeah, it must have been must have been heartbreaking for him uh, to to see that. Now, archaeology is slow and plodding when we're in the field, but top ten lists are not, Brian. So let's keep <laughs> going. What's number six? Number six is the Ishtar Gate and the Processional Way. They kind of go together. It was of all of Nebuchadnezzar's building uh, projects, these are probably the best known. Um, there were eight gates that served as the entrance to Babylon, but the Ishtar Gate was the primary thoroughfare which led to an equally impressive uh, processional way. And um, in his inscription at the gate, Nebuchadnezzar boasts how he constructed uh, the, the, the gate of baked glazed bricks depicting wild oxen and raging dragons. And then, of course, the processional way carried on this motif of blue glazed blick, bricks and, and had a lion motif. Of course, lions were symbols of power in the ancient world and figure prominently in the book of Daniel. Now, it's what's really interesting here is that these were likely completed around 575 BC. So Daniel had already been in Babylon for some time, likely watched these being constructed. And in Daniel chapter 4, we read uh, this account of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, his pride, his downfall, his humiliation, and his restoration, because he's so proud of what he built. And um, this likely happened later in his reign during 573 to 562. And so if this is the case, um, these inscriptions of him boasting about these great things that he built uh, at the Ishtar Gate and the processional way uh, add weight to the words uh, that Daniel includes there about, about the king's pride and him needing to humble himself. Yeah, it fits right in the context, as we've been saying all along, and we often say. Okay, uh, now we're on to number five, which is not Babylon 5, the old TV show, but Babylonian Chronicle 5 for number five. Go, Brian. All right, the Babylonian Chronicle 5. The Babylonian Chronicles are clay tablets written in cuneiform script that describe a, the significant events in the Babylonian Empire year by year. And the Chronicle for the years 605 to 595, known as ABC 5, or more popularly as the Ju Jerusalem Chronicle, they cover um, the time, the early time when Daniel was in Babylon. It describes his accession. It's probably most famous for the fact that it describes in details Nebuchadnezzar's siege of Jerusalem in 597, talks about him uh, deposing King Jehoiachin, appointing King Zedekiah, taking tribute uh, to Babylon. But what's really interesting is that it actually alludes to the earlier, um, his earlier campaign when he took Daniel uh, captive. It says this, in the accession year, Nebuchadnezzar went back again to the Hatti land, that's the Babylonian term for the region that included Judah, um, and he marched unopposed through the Hatti land, and in the month of Sabatu, he took heavy tribute from the Hatti land territory to Babylon. And so while he is going through this territory. Jerusalem is likely, is, is one of those places he stops, and Daniel is likely one of the heavy tribute that's being described there that is taken back to Babylon. It's cool stuff. Okay, one of my favorites, uh, this is actually one of my favorite discoveries related to Daniel, the Nabonidus uh, Cylinders, number four. 
Number four, nabonidus cylinders. Yeah, these are really interesting because prior um, to the middle of the 19th century, a Babylonian king named Belshazzar, um, Daniel 5.1, was unknown to history. Ancient historians like uh, Barosus and Abedinus recorded that Nabonidus was the last king of Babylon. And this changed, of course, in 1854 when J.E. Taylor discovered four uh, cylinders in the ruins of a ziggurat at Ur, which contained a prayer of King Nabonidus. And in this prayer, he prays for his son, Belshazzar. He says, as for Belshazzar, my oldest son, my offspring, instill reverence for your great Godhead in his heart that he may not commit any cultic mistake. And then in 1924, another inscription called the Persian verse account of Nabonidus was discovered, and it describes how he, how Nabonidus went on this big trip, and he says he entrusted the army to his oldest son, his firstborn. He let everything go. He entrusted the kingship to him and himself, and he started out on a long journey. Now, both of these are really important because they affirm that Belshazzar had been entrusted with the kingship and was king of Babylon reigning at the end, the night actually, when um, Babylon fell. And it makes sense then of the uh, the reward that Belshazzar offers Daniel for for the writing translating the writing on the wall. He offers him the third highest place in the kingdom, not the second highest place. Third highest place is all he could offer because he was co-regent with his father. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And for like you said, you know, for a long time the Greek histories ended with now you know Nabonidus. We didn't know anything about Belshazzar except for from the Bible. It speaks right into the political structure of that time requires really an eyewitness uh, nature of the text, which is exactly what we find, Brian. Well, thank you for that. We're going to talk again about Nabonidus, another discovery related to him in our next segment. And friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth, the top 10 discoveries in the book of Daniel. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. I'm your host, and I'm here with Brian Wendell, my friend and also ABR staff member. Uh, uh, the Lord also has him serving as a pastor up in in Canada. Okay, Brian, uh, we are down to the top three uh, discoveries of the book of Daniel. I mean, it's just such a rich book. There's so much history, so much archaeology, but you've, you've identi identified some exciting discoveries. Number three related to Nabonidus. Go ahead, please. All right, the number three uh, discovery, I think, uh, in, in terms of importance related to the book of Daniel is the Nabonidus Chronicle. Um, the ba Babylonian Chronicle for the years 556 to 539 are, are also called the, ba the Nabonidus Chronicle, and it describes the final years of Nabonidus' reign and the fall of Babylon to Cyrus, the king of Persia. And it, it records this, when Cyrus did battle uh, against the armies of Akkad, uh, the people of Akkad retreated on the 16th day, Ugbaru, the governor of Gutium, and the army of Cyrus without battle, entered Babylon. And then a few days later, Cyrus himself enters Babylon. And there are numerous uh, details in this text that are in alignment with the brief biblical description of the fall of Babylon in Daniel chapter 5. Uh, first of all, uh, Babylon, the city of Babylon, was captured without battle. And this seems to also affirm Herodotus's account that um, the Persians diverted the river, um, which uh, lowered the water level of the river going into Babylon, and the Persian soldiers were able to, to sneak in that way. And, um, and also that uh, Herodotus says that it, it, was, it was during a festival that this happened, which is, of course, what, what the biblical text says, too. And uh, Daniel 5 describes the great feast the night that it fell. And so there's no mention made of a battle there. Um, it just simply states um, that uh, Belshazzar was slain, and, and we know that from history, too. So it, it just it all kind of connects together, um, obviously written by someone who had an intimate knowledge of what was happening at that time. 
Yeah, I keep asking the logical and apologetic question, how could a Daniel living four centuries later in Israel have known all this? And it seems obvious to me the answer. Uh, okay, number two, Brian, really a really famous discovery that a lot of people may have already heard of, but of great importance related to the book of Daniel. That's right. It's the Cyrus Cylinder. Um, Daniel 628 records that Daniel prospered during the reign of King Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Uh, so Daniel spent uh, most of his life in, life in Babylon. He lived through the reigns of six Babylonian kings from Nebuchadnezzar through to Nabonidus and Belshazzar. He lived through the reign of Darius the Mede, and there are different views of who that is. Um, and, and then at least into the third year of Cyrus, uh, the great Daniel 10.1 says he would have witnessed firsthand the Persian king's um, declaration um, releasing the Jewish people to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. And in 1879, uh, this uh, clay cylinder was discovered in the ruins of Babylon, uh, possibly in the temple of Marduk, although that's a little fuzzy. The Cyrus Cylinder, as it's come to be known, uh, records in a Canadian Acadian cuneiform a general description from Cyrus the Great allowing um, peoples who were captive in Babylon to return to their homelands and take their idols with them. He says the sacred centers on the other side of the Tigris, whose sanctuaries had been abandoned for a long time. I returned the images of these gods who had resided there to their places. I let them dwell in eternal uh, abodes. I gathered all the inhabitants and returned them to their dwellings. Of course, he's doing this to try and appease all the gods and, and, and curry good favor with all the gods of all the people. But the Cyrus Cylinder makes clear that that was the policy, the policy that we see described in the book of Ezra. Now, in the case of the Jewish people, they didn't have idols, and so they were uh, allowed to take back all of the vessels that had been taken from the temple and allowed to go back and rebuild their temple. Yeah, it's remarkable. And, you know, there's many uh, prophetic visions given in the Old Testament to the prophets. Um, but in this case, we actually, God names names, Cyrus here. That's the one of the unique aspects of, of that prophecy. Okay, Brian, well, you know, they're all exciting discoveries, but, uh, you know, here we are. We're down to number one, uh, the number one discovery related to the book of Daniel. Yeah, the number one discovery related to the book of Daniel, I think, is the, uh, the Dead Sea Scroll fragments of the book of Daniel. They're hugely important. Uh, first of all, Jesus attributed the prophecies in Daniel to Daniel himself, Matthew 24. But many today, as we've mentioned, would argue that the book of Daniel was not composed by Daniel the prophet in the 6th century, but by someone much later during the 2nd century after, and this is key, after the prophecies that are in the book of Daniel, because critics say there is no such thing as foretelling the future, and so this book must have been written after these particular events. It's important to note the presupposition of the critics and the bias that they have when they come uh, to this particular text. Um, now, the problem with that is that there have been a number of copies and, and fragments of Daniel that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the earliest dates to the second century. And so there really is not enough time for uh, this book to have been written, people say in the 160s BC, um, to encourage the Jews under under uh, who are being persecuted. Uh, there's not enough time for the book to have been written, to have been widely circumcised, uh, widely um, um, spread around, and then to have been accepted as canonical. Because one of the things you see at the Qumran community is that it was accepted pretty much as canon. There's so many copies of it. It's quoted also in other Qumran uh, scrolls. And so there really is not enough time for it to be widely circulated and to be accepted as canon. And I think that this this discovery falsifies the view that it was a late uh, second century uh, composition. It just it makes way more sense um, to accept it as a sixth century composition based on the details that we know of from archaeology and based on the fact that it's widely accepted now in the second century at Qumran. Yeah, and the Qumran community was not the central authority keeping the, the original scrolls. Uh, they would have been kept in Jerusalem. So the fact that they were already there buried in caves points to that. Okay, Brian, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to wrap up Daniel. How's that for an assignment for you? <laughs> Sounds good. Um, 
here's how I look at it. If you look at this with an open mind, and I, I will admit my bias coming at Scripture, um, having a high regard for it, but there are just too many details that have been affirmed by archaeology that that demonstrate that that the Daniel describing uh, the 6th century is accurately describing 6th century history, details that a writer living over 400 years later I don't think could have possibly known. And so it makes more sense to say that these discoveries are authentic, that these that the, the book of Daniel, rather, is authentic, that it is historically reliable, that it is describing a period that Daniel the prophet actually lived through, and that his book was widely circulated and accepted as canon as it should be. Well, amen to that, Brian. Thank you for all the uh, good work on this subject, and thanks for being on the show once again. Well, friends, uh, you can see that you can trust the book of Daniel, and I'm reminded that Jesus points to himself as the Son of Man, which is in Daniel chapter 7. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, and we hope that you'll embrace this truth today. Thank you for watching Digging for Truth.